I would invite you to take your copy of God's Word and turn to Luke chapter 1. We're going to be looking this morning at the birth of John the Baptist and the prophecies of Zechariah that would come after that. But before we get into sermon this morning, um, I do want to speak to a few things. And um, I, I recognize that we have guests with us today, and we're grateful that you're here. Uh, I don't want to create an awkward situation for you here. This is not a moment to, to, to try to air our laundry or to do anything like that. But I do want to address just a few things to the church. We are a faith family, and these gatherings are important. And it's important when we come together that uh, we do what is needed as we minister to one another and seek to honor the Lord together. And I want to at least speak to the church um, pastorally. This would be my first Sunday uh, officially as an elder in the church here. Uh, and this is not necessarily the conversation I would want to have uh, beginning that time, but I, I do want to share just a few things with you that are on my heart. Uh, and I have put some of these things before the elders and before some other friends in ministry uh, before coming to you this morning, but just want to share a few things. First, on behalf of Maggie and I, I do want to take this opportunity just to express our humble gratitude to you uh, for the love that you have shown our family um, since our arrival here at New Hope. Uh, we came here about three years ago, I guess, and uh, we, came, we came to see friends. to the next place. I left a, a church that I was serving in East Kentucky, and uh, we, were, we were going to be seeing what the Lord had in store for us next, but we came here and we felt like we were home. And so I'm so grateful for that and for the love you've given to us, and, and now for the trust that you have placed uh, in us in, in affirming me to serve now as an elder in our congregation. I want you to know that's not something I take lightly. Um, 1 Timothy 3 tells us that if anyone aspires to the office of an elder, that he desires a noble task. And while this is not something that I was actively seeking out, I, I do count it a privilege to have been considered and to be affirmed. And I look forward to being able to serve uh, in the days ahead. And so to serve as a pastor, as an elder, as an overseer, whatever phrase you want to use, they're used interchangeably in the scripture. It is indeed a noble task. It is a good work to be done. But it can also be a very difficult task. Um, there is a weightiness in knowing that you have been given charge over God's people in a local body uh, as an under-shepherd. Uh, the job of preaching and teaching and caring for souls and watching over the general welfare of the church at large, it's not an easy one. And I am sure that our brothers among us who have been serving in this role for long before Maggie and I were ever even here can attest to that reality. But serving as an elder is also a source of great joy. And so I want you to know there's, there's the light in obedience and doing what God has called you to, what God has prepared you for, and seeing the way that God can work among His people. And so I look forward to serving you in the days ahead, and I have great hope for the future of this faith family. And so I would ask, as we begin this new uh, kind of thing, for, for us anyway, that you would pray for me and that you would pray for Maggie and for our children. Uh, we do have an enemy who uh, is always at work uh, trying to undermine God's good purposes and his plans. And uh, we know that our family, uh, in a moment like this, can become all the more vulnerable uh, because uh, we have an enemy who uh, not only is in rebellion against the Lord, but also despises his church. And so pray for us as we move forward in the days ahead. Second, I want to say to you that while Maggie and I are rejoicing, we know that the results of last Sunday's vote are bittersweet. Uh, I was approved to serve as a new elder in this congregation. And while that was happening, Derek Morris was also being considered. And while he received an 84% vote of affirmation, which well exceeds what would be considered a supermajority in just about any situation. 
uh, it, that did fall short of the 90% threshold that is required by our Constitution. And so I will say to you that in my conversations since last Sunday night and then this vote was taken, the people that I have spoken to have expressed a mixture of shock and disappointment, and I completely understand those sentiments. Derek and his wife Lauren have served our church faithfully for longer than Maggie and I have been around for sure. As best as we can tell, their life and their witness speaks for itself. When this discussion about selecting new elders in the church came up, um, I was glad that Derek was a part of that conversation. And I will tell you that in the weeks leading up to our, our vote on Sunday night, that Derek and I spoke regularly. We talked a lot about our perspectives on the current state of the church. We shared a lot of ideas about what we might hope to accomplish in the days ahead. And I was very much looking forward to serving alongside him in the elder body if we were to be affirmed. And I will tell you that is certainly not what I had hoped for to be moving forward without him. Now, I want to be abundantly clear about something. As far as I am concerned, when we consider what Scripture has to say about those who would hold the office of the elder, I believe that Derek is undeniably qualified. When you read what the Scripture has to say, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 2-7, through 7, Therefore an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. You go to Titus chapter 1, chapter one you see many of these same things repeated. And when I consider the qualifications that are laid out in the Scripture, I see nothing that would give me pause concerning Derek or his family. Now, beyond being biblically qualified, I believe that Derek has proven through the years in various settings and in his preaching over the last couple of months that he is up to the task. He's clearly diligent in his study. He's gifted in his ability to understand and to teach God's Word. He has pastoral wisdom that has long benefited those who have come to him for counsel. And many of you can attest to that. So I am thankful. And by the way, brother, we're glad that you're here. And we're glad that you're feeling better. Y'all know he's had a rough week. Felt like he was on death's door. But we are glad that you're here. But I am thankful for Derek and Lauren's service to this body through the years. I am confident that it will continue, regardless of whether there is any particular title or position given. And I think, though, that Derek has more to offer this body. And I just want to be clear about that. I, I think with his gifts and his wisdom, he offers a lot that we would all benefit from. And I want, to, I want to make it clear that it is my hope that sometime in the future, perhaps even in the near future, that he will be given the opportunity to serve this body as an elder. And I believe that's a conversation that needs to be continued. Now, as part of that conversation, I want to invite you, personally and on behalf of our other elders, to give us your feedback. We want to hear from you. Our elders already have have spent time speaking with Derek and examining his life. They submitted him to the church for affirmation. And there's been nothing in his life or in his teaching that would change their view or my view that he is well qualified for this work. But we realize that we're not perfect. We realize that we don't always judge everything exactly the right way. We can make mistakes. So if you are someone here who voted not to affirm, understand, this. I'm not here to... To, to, to come at you today. That's not the goal here. But if you are someone here this morning who voted not to affirm and you did so on the basis of a legitimate biblical concern based upon the qualifications in Scripture that are given for those who would serve the Lord and His church in this way, 
then I want you to know we need to hear from you. We need to hear from you. If there is something that we are blind to, that you know exists, then by all means, will you please bring those things to us so that we as shepherds can address those things in Derek's life and so that we can, can help a brother see where he's weak and help him find a way forward. Furthermore, if you voted not to affirm based upon some sort of confusion about the way that things were presented, the way things were being done, the kind of choice that you were being asked to make, please come speak to us and let us help you understand what it is that we as elders and as a church body are hoping to accomplish. But even as I extend that invitation, I want to offer a word of warning. Again, this is my first Sunday in the official capacity of an elder. But I have watched as quietly as I could over the past few months different ways that things have happened in our church body um, and have not really been in a position to speak. And, and now that I'm here, I, I want you to know I, I'm, not, I'm not here to lash out. I'm not here for any other purpose. I, I really want to see the best for this body. And so as I extend that invitation that you would come and please share with us where you see there may be troubles. I do want to give a warning. And again, if you're a visitor here today, and this is really weird, I'm sorry. We're going to get past this in just a few more minutes, and we're going to go on. But to our faith family, we've already heard over the past week, some cases directly, in some cases by word of mouth. And we want to speak that very carefully when we've not been directly involved in some of those conversations. But we have heard several of the reasons that people voted not to affirm both Derek and me. And while we are ready and willing to acknowledge any legitimate biblical concerns and try to deal with those things faithfully, I want to be clear to you that none of the reasons that were brought to any of us had anything to do with the biblical qualification that would be laid out for someone to serve in the office of an elder. None of them involved questions of character or gifting or calling in any of the things that would pertain to someone holding the role of a pastor. No concerns were brought leading up to this vote. And any that have been expressed in the aftermath have not been relevant to the question at hand. Instead, those who have shared their reasons for voting against affirmation have shared that they did so on the basis of things that had nothing to do really with Derek or me at all. I'm not going to go into all of those reasons. But I will hit on one. There are at least a few in our congregation. And realistically, a few is all it took with such a high threshold. Who made it clear that you did not support Derek and that you did not support me, not because of any concerns that you had with either of us, but because of concerns you had with other people, namely the elders who put our names forward for affirmation. Because you struggled with trust or respect, because something hadn't gone the way that you hoped that it had gone, you were unwilling to cast a vote of affirmation that would allow one of their recommendations to succeed. And so I want to say, if that is you, and by the way, let's be realistic about this. I was affirmed with 91%. Derek was given an 84% vote of affirmation. This is not a large group of people. But nonetheless, it's there. And if that is you, if you were willing to ignore what God's Word says, if you were willing to reject qualified, faithful men, with qualified, faithful wives who have loved and served this body because of some personal issue that you have with someone else in this body, 
or because of some twisted desire to see someone else fail, then I would challenge you to give very serious consideration to what's going on in your heart. Before we go too much further down this road, let me say, this is not about sour grapes. This is not about some sort of personal offense. I've pastored for 16 years, and that's taught me a lot about how to get over myself. Uh, you're, nobody's, you're not always going to have everybody cheering you on. You know, not everybody's going to be a fan. And sometimes I'm going to do stupid stuff that's going to upset you, and I get that. That's not what this is about. By the way, I also should say I don't know who voted how. Haven't got a clue, don't want to know, don't need to know. But I will say to you, this is not about me. This is not about Derek. This is not about me trying to defend someone who I count as a friend. This is about us. As a faith family, as a church body, and the ways that we would go forward in service to the Lord. This is about the present and future health of our church. And so it should be clear enough that if you are willing to ignore what the Bible says about the qualifications for someone who would serve in the office of the elder, and if you are willing to work against the interests of the church or to reject a faithful brother based upon your own personal opinions of other people, based upon perhaps some sort of resentment or bitterness that you're harboring in your heart, it should be pretty clear that is not God-honoring. That is not Christ glorifying. And I will say to you without hesitation, if that is, is where you're at right now, you need to repent. You need to own your sin. You need to confess to God and to your brothers and sisters where you've done wrong. And you need to find a way to kill off that bitterness, that resentment in your heart and lay aside your personal agenda for the good of the body and the glory of God. Look, folks, it's obvious that we have some things to work on around here, all right? There are some relationships that are broken that need to be mended before they tear this church apart. There are some hearts that are going to have to change. There's going to have to be some shared humility and repentance and willingness to overlook what really ought to be some pretty minor offenses in various ways and to forgive. There is trust that has been lost, that will need to be earned back. And if we can't do these things, then we're going to have a very difficult time moving forward as a church. And so we must. And I believe that by God's mercy we can and that we will. And I'm committed to doing all that I can moving forward as an elder, as a brother, to see that happen. So, in the days ahead, I want to encourage all of you who are part of our faith family to do a few things. First, will you join me in earnest prayer for New Hope Baptist Church? Will you join with me in praying that God will work in the hearts of His people and bring us to a place together of humble submission to His Word, and to His will? Will you pray specifically for broken relationships to be mended and fellowship to be restored among brothers and sisters in this body who are not loving each other as they should? I think there's this thing that's happening where we all know there are a few things that aren't quite right. There are a few people who aren't getting along, but that is spilling over into this body and it is hurting our fellowship together. Will you pray? Second, Will you commit yourself to not being drawn into the fray? We are in an unfortunate place right now as a church. There are individuals who have ought with other believers in this congregation. And unfortunately, in some cases, they are doing their best to draw up the battle line. They're doing their best to bring people to their side, whatever that is. And so we have this never-ending stream of side huddles and hushed conversations, of phone calls and 
living room meetings and all these things that are being used to this end. But I want to ask you, how do you think that's going so far? Have these things served us well over the past few months? Are we better off as a church? Is God being glorified? Is the gospel being lived out in a winsome way? I want to remind you, as you are tempted to be drawn into these personal disputes of the words of Proverbs 8.17, the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. Brothers and sisters, do not allow yourself to be drawn into the fray. Resist the urge to want to hear the latest bit of gossip. When one brother or sister comes to you to speak ill of another brother or sister, shut that conversation down. Send them to address their concerns with the one that they've come to complain to you about. And if they insist they've already tried that, then take them to that person yourself and let that conversation be had again. And if they are unwilling to have that conversation face to face, if they are unwilling to do that in the light, then refuse to have anything to do with that and don't let that conversation go any further. Third, will you commit as you seek to love and honor the Lord to also love and honor your brothers and sisters in this faith family? And will you commit to doing so with joy. I know I'm taking a lot of time here. But before we go, I want to read you one last passage of Scripture. Listen to what Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. How ought we to be treating one another within the household of God? Listen to these words. Let love Be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. The contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, You will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Brothers and sisters, this is our calling as children of God. And so I pray that we would live up to that calling as we go forward in this faith family. Listen, this is difficult stuff to talk about. And there are going to be more difficult conversations, I'm sure, in the days ahead. But folks, we've got work to do. And we don't have time to stand here fighting with each other about silly stuff. There's a world that is perishing. There is darkness that needs to be overcome by the light. And we know that we are fully dependent upon Christ's mercies. And we are seeking to follow Him and honor Him, but we're going to have to get past some of these things if we're going to do that well. Folks, I love you. I love this church. There's a reason 
when we came that it didn't take much to convince us to stay. We have found a home here. And now some things are changing and there's, there's a new opportunity perhaps for me to, to, to be involved in different ways in the ministry of the church. And, and I really hope that I don't have to do this again in a long time. But guys, we, we've got some things we've got to deal with. Can we just be humble? Can we acknowledge our sin? Can we make peace with our brothers and move on? So on that note, most awkward Christmas sermon I ever heard. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. We're going to continue this morning our look at the Christmas story. And considering this morning the birth of John the Baptist, specifically the prophecy of Zechariah, concerning who Jesus, uh, who Jesus was and, and who would be born soon after, we'll see in this a picture of our Lord, of who He would be, what He would accomplish. We'll also see here John's purpose. And we're going to see in the ministry of John the Baptist some things that might help to teach us about who we ought to be and what we ought to be doing. And so we're going to look this morning at the Lord's Word. We're in Luke chapter 1. We'll begin in verse 57. And we're going to cover more, but we'll stop reading this morning in verse 66. We read Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 57. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. And they would have called him Zechariah after his father. But his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, None of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to his father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet, and he wrote, His name is John. And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed, and he spoke, Blessing God. And fear came on all their neighbors, and all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. We'll stop there for now. Let's pray together. Father, we delight this morning in your word. We rejoice in the hope that is ours because of Jesus Christ. And God, in spite of some of the difficult conversation we've had already, we pray now that as we come to the Scripture, that this is where we would really find that we find joy in coming to You in Your Word, learning from You, being uh, encouraged by You, being equipped by You, being convicted by You. Let the Word of God do its work today, we pray. In Christ's name, Amen. In the beginning of Luke's Gospel, we are introduced to two people. Zechariah and Elizabeth. Now, we talked briefly about them last week, and you are probably familiar with their story. Verse 6 tells us that they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and the statutes of the Lord. And we're told in verse 7 that Zechariah and Elizabeth had no children because Elizabeth was barren. She was infertile. She was unable to conceive. And we're also told that they were both advanced in years. Now, one can assume by this point in their lives they had resigned themselves to the fact that they would not have children. And we know that they had devoted themselves to serving the Lord. Zechariah was a priest of God. We're told that while his division was on duty, he was the one who was chosen to enter the holy place and burn incense before the Lord while others prayed in the outer areas of the temple. And that itself was no small thing. Priests were only allowed to do this if they were chosen by lot to do so. And they could only do it once in their lifetime. And so the fact that Zechariah was chosen to go before the Lord in such a way at this moment in time was not a coincidence. This was undoubtedly the work of God. God had a plan. He knew what he was doing. And Zechariah was going to be a part of that plan. We read earlier in Luke's Gospel there that as Zechariah ministered in the holy place, an angel of the Lord, who we later see as Gabriel, appeared to him standing next to the altar of incense. And as we would expect, he was struck with fear. 
The text says that Zechariah was troubled when he saw him and fear fell upon him. But just as the angel did with Mary and Joseph, Gabriel spoke to Zechariah telling him not to be afraid. Because just as it would be for Mary and for Joseph, the angel brought Zechariah good news. His prayers had been heard. His groanings before the Lord had been heard. And his wife Elizabeth was going to have a son. And he told him, you're going to call his name John. A name which literally means God has shown grace. And that would be true in more ways than one. Not only would Zechariah and Elizabeth miraculously have a son, but that son would have a special purpose. In verse 14 of Luke chapter 1, the angel said, You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So John would be great for the, before the Lord and he would have a special calling. John would be what was called at that time a Nazarite one who had been set apart for a special purpose. That's what that part about not drinking wine or strong drink is all about. And there were other things also that were assigned to the one who would take that Nazarite vow. Even from his mother's womb, we, we find out that he would be filled with the Holy Spirit. That itself is so remarkable because when is it that God's people are typically filled with his Holy Spirit? It's when regeneration takes place, right? When we come to faith and we put our trust in Jesus, we have John the Baptist leaping in the womb full of the Holy Spirit, when Jesus, also in the womb, came near. We're told that as he grew older, in the spirit and the power of Elijah, he would come out as a prophet who would prepare the way for the coming Messiah. Daryl's read already for us from Isaiah chapter 40 about the one, the voice that would cry in the wilderness, telling people to get ready for the coming of the Lord. And that would be John's purpose. Now, of course, all this seemed beyond comprehension to Zechariah. And so he asked, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. Another way of saying that might be, hey, okay, that sounds great, but how am I supposed to believe you? With all due respect, Mr. Angel, me and Elizabeth, we're, we're not exactly spring chickens anymore, all right? We've been around a while. We haven't had a child in all these years, and we're well beyond the time when people would typically have children. How could this possibly be true? But Gabriel told Zechariah that he had been sent from God to bring this good news and it would come to pass. And so both to serve as a sign and as a judgment for his unbelief, Zechariah was made silent. He was unable to speak until the child was born. And after that, we're told the angel departed. He left Zechariah in the holy place. We're told that when he came out and he was unable to speak, that everyone else knew that something remarkable had happened during that time when he was ministering in the holy place. And eventually when his time of service was done, he went home and just had been, as had been promised, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And all of this prepares us for what's beginning to unfold in verse 57. So you fast forward nine months. And in verse 57, we're told that the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth. And just as Gabriel had promised, she gave birth to a son. Verse 58 tells us that her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. This was cause for celebration, and it was right for them to celebrate. The birth of any child is a blessing, and we ought to celebrate that together. There are those times when it's just a little bit extra special. This would have been true for Zechariah and Elizabeth. Children in that day were considered a symbol of blessing. And by the way, though we don't often regard it, we ought to consider it the same way today. These children were a blessing. But on the opposite side of that, when a couple could not have children, it was often assumed that somehow they were the opposite of blessed. Perhaps they were under a curse. Perhaps they were under some kind of judgment from God. It's not really fair. It definitely wasn't always the case. It's not the case in our day. But ultimately, couples who could not have children were often looked upon 
with scorn and shame, especially the women. And that's why Elizabeth, back uh, in, in verse 25 there, when, when Elizabeth says, in giving her a son, God has taken away her reproach. So everyone saw this as a work of God's mercy, and they were celebrating together the birth of this child. The simple reality of being able to have a child was a remarkable gift from God to Elizabeth and to Zechariah, even apart from his calling and his greatness before the Lord. Well, in verse 59, we see that on the eighth day after his birth, they took the baby to the temple to be circumcised. This was in accordance with the law. It's also an important family tradition. And I say that for this reason. It was a time when, when extended family and friends would often come to be part of the ceremony. It's a time when the child would be dedicated to the Lord and the parents and the extended family would pledge to raise him to, to know God and to love God and to live in according to his teachings. And those who were gathered around at this time when this baby is going to receive his name, they wanted him to be named Zechariah after his father. But his parents knew better. His name had already been chosen. It had been revealed directly from God himself through the ministry of his angel. And so Elizabeth told them, no, his name is going to be John. Well, the family protested. Why would you name him that? Any of y'all ever went to name your kids and got some criticism along that line? Why are you going to name him John? There ain't nobody in your family named John. Name him after his dad. Wouldn't that be great for him to be his father's namesake? But she says, no, that's not going to be. Well, they don't, they don't trust Elizabeth, do they? They're not going to take her word for it. How could you do this to your husband? So they go to Zechariah, and they begin to question him. So what does he do? He calls for a tablet, and he writes the words, his name is John. And we're told in verse 63 that at that they all wondered. It didn't make sense to them, but very soon it would. Because when Zechariah obeyed the Lord, when he confirmed that the boy would be called John, we read that then his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed and he spoke, blessing God. And all of this had a tremendous effect on those who saw it unfolding. We're told in verse 65 that fear then came upon all their neighbors. They knew something out of the ordinary was going on here. Fear came upon all their neighbors and all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. The word is spreading throughout the country of Judea about the miraculous birth of this baby named John and the most unusual circumstances that surrounded it. We're told that the people were stuck with a certain sort of fear, a reverence toward God, knowing that he was up to something. They knew that the hand of the Lord was on this child, but they did not know why. So they asked themselves, what then will this child be? We're going to see very soon in Zechariah's prophecy the answer to that question. You know, it's amazing that even at his, at his birth, John already knows how to stir up the crowd. He, he already, in the very beginning, has, has, has stirred the hearts of the people. And they're asking these questions, beginning to marvel, what in the world is going on with this guy? Well, it was just getting started, wasn't it? You know, I, I, I think through this passage, and I, I'm struck by the irony of the response from those who saw this happening. Certainly, the, the birth of John the Baptist was miraculous, and I don't at all want to downplay that, but the whole point of John's ministry would be what? To help the people understand that, hey, you, you, you ain't seen nothing yet, right? You, you, don't, you don't have any idea what it is that's coming your way you think this is great? He, he knew how to draw a crowd. People came out to hear him as he grew, to, as he was preaching and teaching. They would come out and listen. But he said, oh, no, no, no. This is just a precursor. A, a man's mouth being shut and him not being allowed to speak until after he names his newborn son, that's certainly unusual. Uh, a woman who is well up in years being able to conceive and have a son after being barren for her entire life, that's, that's certainly unique. But oh, just wait. Wait until the virgin conceives and bears a son. Wait until the Messiah comes on the scene. Wait until the stars light up the heavens that guide the way to Bethlehem. Wait until choruses of angels show up to a bunch of shepherds out in a field and start singing their praises to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You think this is something. You just wait. 
This is the whole point of John's ministry. And even in his birth, as people are marveling, oh, there's more to come. Zechariah knew that John was special. But he also knew that he would point to one who was even more special. And so as you move forward here in Luke's gospel, you begin to see how Zechariah, filled with the Holy Spirit, begins to prophesy. He's declaring a word from God. And what does he say? Look at verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for He has visited and redeemed His people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of His servant David, as He spoke by the mouth of His holy prophets from of old that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember His holy covenant, the oath that He swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve Him without fear in holiness and righteousness before Him all our days. There's an interesting thing that's happening here. After meeting the angel of the Lord and being struck with silence, unable to speak for this entire time, waiting for the birth of His Son, they come and say, hey, call him Zechariah, and he has to write on the tablet, his name is John, and he blesses the Lord, and he begins to speak, but he's not talking about his boy. He's been waiting all this time, years of barrenness and crying out to God, asking for mercy, asking him to give him a son, but when his son is born and they pronounce his name, he starts to bless God and he doesn't say, let me tell you about John. Let me tell you how great he is. He says, oh, no, no, no. There's something more at work here. God is up to something a lot greater than the birth of this boy. He speaks not of John here, but he speaks of another. As he is worshiping and blessing the Lord God of Israel, he tells us why that Lord God of Israel is worthy of worship. Because he is bringing salvation. Break it down. Think about what Zechariah says. One of the things he says here, verse 68. Blessed be the Lord of God of Israel. Why? Because he is visiting his people. Last week we saw in John chapter 1 how the Word, who was in the beginning, was with God, was God, became flesh and came to dwell among us. Jesus is the holy visitation of God among men. God was coming to visit his people. And so Zechariah rejoiced. God was coming to redeem His people. Through Jesus Christ, the price for sin would be paid and His people would be free. They would have forgiveness. Jesus' birth was a necessary precursor to His death. He came to the manger so that He could go to the cross and finish God's redeeming work. But God is redeeming His people. What else does He say? Verse 69, God was raising up a horn of salvation. Now, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say that's probably not a phrase you use that often in your conversations. Not something maybe that jumps out to us or makes a ton of sense right off. But it's found in numerous places in the Scripture. This is a statement of power. A statement of might. The picture here is of the horn that would be on an animal or a horn that would be carried in the hands of a warrior as a weapon that would be used in battle to run one's enemies through. Our children aren't here, so they don't get this reference, but you know, they're not here to get the reference. Any of you read the Narnia series in that very last book? You got this unicorn? That's just a beast, right? Cutting through people with that horn, leaving bloody bodies in his wake. Like That's the kind of imagery that's being used here. Like a mighty warrior, the coming Messiah would defeat every enemy of his people. Well, that's no helpless baby laying in a manger. Note how he says this is taking place in the house of David. Again, as we saw last week, this is affirmation. Jesus is indeed the promised Messiah. He is the prophesied one, but he comes as a horn of salvation who will wage war. And we see here that God is keeping His promises. As He's blessing the Lord, what does He say? Just as He spoke by the mouth of His holy prophets from of old. 
God is doing, Zechariah says. The very things that he said he would do, the things that were declared by the prophets, he's, he's bringing those things to pass. He's saving us from our enemies. He's showing us mercy. He's keeping his covenant. All these things that are laid out in that prophecy as it goes forward. And because of this, he says in verse 74, that they could serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all their day. So this is a declaration, the celebration of the Messiah who's coming, a time of worship for Zechariah after the birth of his son. And Zechariah understood the special plan that God had for his son as a part of that. So all the people are marveling. What then will this child be? Obviously the hand of the Lord is with him. John says, oh no, no, God's doing something better. He's sending us the Messiah. He's going to finish his work. He's going to keep his promises. But he does take some time to speak speak concerning his son. In verse 76, he turns his attention here to what John would accomplish. He says, and you, child, think about that. After all these years of waiting and longing and crying out to the Lord, he finally holds his son. And he gives him a name. He's blessing the Lord. He's rejoicing in the coming of Messiah. Can you feel the weightiness of this now as he looks at his own son and says, you, you've got a job to do. He says, you, child, you will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare His ways, to give knowledge of salvation to His people and the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Isaiah wrote in his book of prophecy, we read it last week, the people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. Those who have dwelled in a land of deep darkness, on them the light has shone. John tells us in his gospel, this is a different John, by the way, but John, the apostle, tells us in his gospel that Jesus would be that light that would shine. But he also tells us about John the Baptist and what he would do. John's gospel, chapter 1, verse 6 through 8, he says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. This is what John's ministry, what John's life would be all about. His purpose in life was to bear witness about the light so that all could see and hear and believe in him. As Zechariah says here, he would be a prophet of the Most High God going before the Lord to prepare his ways. John would go before the Lord Jesus. He would declare God's mercy. He would be a messenger, a herald, one who like Elijah before him would declare the Lord's coming and call people to make ready. And so when you look at John's ministry in the Gospels, what do you see? What's the message that he would preach over and over again? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then when Jesus shows up on the scene, do you remember that? He's baptizing there alongside the river and he sees Jesus in the distance coming. And what does he do? Behold, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It's amazing later when when John's disciples later would, would grumble about the fact that people weren't following him anymore because they were following Jesus. The audacity. They were upset about this. And when they would grumble about this, how would John the Baptist respond? He said, look, y'all are missing this. I am not the Christ. I'm not the one they've been waiting for. I've been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him and rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. That's, That's what I'm here for. And he says, I'm glad. This joy is mine, and it is now complete. And that's where he says this, He must increase, and I must decrease. 
What was John's purpose? To go before the Lord, to prepare his way, to be his prophet, and to point people to the knowledge of salvation and the forgiveness of sin. God, in, in his mercy, God was sending his Messiah, and John would be a herald of what God was doing in bringing salvation to his people. John was most certainly a, a very special child. He would grow to become a man like no other. Jesus himself would say at one point, look, there has not been another person born that would live up to John the Baptist. No one else born to women greater than he. And yet when Jesus came onto the scene, when it was time for his earthly ministry to begin, John would happily step out of the way to proclaim that Jesus was the one they had been waiting for. He would count himself nothing in comparison with the Lord. He would tell his followers he was not even worthy to stoop down and to untie the Lord's sandal. And so it was his great and lasting joy and pleasure to know that salvation had come into this world and that God was calling his children to himself through the Savior, Jesus Christ. Now we would never claim John's greatness. But in a sense, in some regards, our calling is the same. We too are called to be heralds of the Messiah who has come. We too are called to proclaim this message of salvation through the forgiveness of sin in Jesus Christ. We too are called to tell people of the true light that has come into the world to break through the darkness to give us life and to give us peace with God. We too are called to think ourselves nothing and Jesus everything. To want more of Him and less of ourselves. And so with humility and thanksgiving, we ought to worship and celebrate the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sins of the world. We ought to find joy in the spread of the gospel, and the salvation of lost people for this purpose that John was sent into the world. Zechariah saw this, he understood this, and he worshipped the Lord for it. And so should we. As we wrap up, three things we can take away from this passage. First, we find here a great reminder of God's faithfulness. God keeps His promises. In the birth of John the Baptist, Scripture is fulfilled as well, as well as the declaration of the angel Gabriel. God is doing what He set out to do long before time began. So let's just be encouraged by the fact that God does what He says He will do, which means that every promise of salvation, every promise for the future that God has given us will come to pass. And it will not be because of our own righteousness or worthiness, but because of His faithfulness because of His mercy, and because of His might. Second, we see our Savior, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world through His birth and His life and His death and His resurrection. We have redemption from sin. He is the great horn of salvation. And though He would come as a baby, He would be a mighty warrior who would fight to the death to rescue us. That didn't look the way they thought it ought to look. At least not the first time around. They were looking for a king who would come and make war to destroy the Romans and overthrow their whole system so that the Jews could rightly reign. He had bigger battles to fight. He wasn't worried about the Romans. Jesus came to defeat every enemy. But He's coming again. And when He comes, He will finish that work. And He won't come as a baby, but He will come as a conquering King. As the ultimate answer to all of God's promises, Jesus comes to bring mercy and grace and also judgment. Because of what He has done, those who trust in Him need not fear anything. And so we can serve Him in righteousness and holiness all our days, just as we were called to do. And finally, in John the Baptist, we see a fulfillment of prophecy. 
a gift of grace, a bold witness to the gospel. And though we may not be everything that he was, we too are called as recipients of God's grace and now instruments of God's grace to be ready and willing and active in sharing the message of the gospel to all who will hear it. We should devote ourselves to this task. We ought to be committed to fulfill our calling, the command of God to make disciples of the nations. And so that means we ought to be praying faithfully for lost people. We need to be asking God to reach them in their sinful state and bring them to faith in His Son. It means we need to be willing to give sacrificially to help support others who are doing this work around the world. By the way, it's good to have you with us today. Celso and Andrea are here, and we have been engaged with them in ministry around the globe for a long time. We are delighting in the work that God has in store for you. We're glad that you're able to be here now and to minister to your family. But we look forward to the next report of what God is doing in that work. So we should give to help support the work of the gospel that's going out in other places for those who are able to go and do that. But we've also got to get to work ourselves. Whether you're crossing the globe or crossing the street, we must be bold, faithful, and sharing the message that this world is broken, that sin wrecks our lives, but that salvation and forgiveness is found in Jesus Christ and in Him alone. We can be very good at sorting out our theology. We can sit down and talk about the Bible for a long time. We, we can wage war against the sin in our lives and walk in holiness together before God. We can get a whole lot of stuff right. But if we get to the point where we can say that we understand the gospel, but we are not preaching the gospel, then there's good reason to believe that we don't understand the gospel quite as well as we might think. So, we certainly pray and we give, but we must be a part of the work of declaring the good news, the Messiah's coming to a world that needs to hear it. Zechariah proclaimed in his prophecies that the Savior was coming. God was going to visit His people. He was going to redeem. He was raising up this horn of salvation. We can dis- declare with Him that the Savior has come. And we must declare that He is coming again. And while we wait, we prepare the way for His arrival. And so, I pray that that message, that reality, would resonate in our heart and would transform our celebration while we remember the Savior's birth. This is not a sentimental happy moment where we think about a sweet little child. We're talking about the Savior of the world. He has come. And he's coming again. So let's do all that we can ourselves to make sure that we are ready for his coming. And let's call others to make way because he's, he's coming. Let's pray together. Father, we rejoice in your precious promises. You sent your son into this world just as you said you would do. He lived a sinless life just as you said he would. He gave Himself as a sacrifice for sin, just as You said He would. He rose again victorious on the third day, just as You said He would. He ascended into heaven, just as You said He would. And one day, He will come back, just as You have promised He will do. God, help us to rejoice in our salvation, the gift we have been given through Your Son, Jesus Christ. And God, help us to be faithful as we wait for His coming. God, we need Your mercy. There's no question about that. We need You. But God, we know You have promised never to leave us, never to forsake us. And so God, we take comfort in that. Help us to be faithful while we wait for the Lord's coming. To preach His gospel, to love our brothers and sisters, and to hold up the truth of His Word above all else. We pray this in Christ's name. Remember tonight, 6 o'clock, here in the sanctuary, our kids have a presentation for us and some light refreshments to follow. I hope to see you there.